referred to myself as a child yesterday, and I don't regret it. I don't take it back. I am when it comes to these things of God. I am accused of probably being simple, uh, simplistic, common. I just believe God, and I take him at his word. I believe uh, the scriptures. I'm a literalist, and um, I'm happy to be that. I thank God that I'm that. And Jesus talks about little children. I'm going to go to that in a second here. But welcome to the Revelation series, and I've been talking about the shock that our religious people, those who have access to the light yet who reject the light, are actually uh, subject to the greater judgment, the greater judgment. And there will be degrees of judgment meted out at the great white throne. Really, that's part of the whole point here, since we're talking about the great white throne. How can judgment be adjusted in death? It can't be, because death is the great equalizer. Judgment must come in life. And if it doesn't come in this life, and it doesn't because everything's topsy-turvy, nobody gets what's coming to them here, the righteous get uh, stomped on and the uh, unrighteous get promoted. And uh, they put their unrighteous acts as uh, entries on their resume, resume enha enhancements, their dirty deeds that are done dirt cheap, resume enha enhancements for the wicked today. Uh, so the time is coming when the dead and the small will have to be raised from the... Uh, raised from the dead and brought to life because only in life can these micro adjustments and macro adjustments be made this is where Sodom the inhabitant of the inhabitants of Sodom stand next to uh, my hypothetical woman yeah I mentioned yesterday uh, Agnes Jones who rejected Peter when he showed up at her door Peter wasn't famous then that's the trick you see <laughs> yes if the world if the famous evangelist from the temple um, um, Elmer Schmidt let's say one of the famous Pharisees if he had come to her door oh she would be deferential oh it's it's Harrison Schmidt what did I call the guy I can't even remember it doesn't matter Oh, when I was a kid, you know, in the Catholic Church, if a priest came to your house for lunch, it was the bomb. I mean, you put out the red carpet, you practically bowed down to the priest, and you made sure that the lunch was the best. All the moms went went nuts over the priest because he was celebrated. He was noted. He had been to the school. He had been accepted by the diocese. He had been blessed by the bishop and probably promoted by the pope. And here he came for a beer and a hamburger to your house on Sunday. And it was, oh, it's all about the pope. And... um Agnes and uh, Joe would have turned off their television had one of the esteemed priests from the temple arrived at their house. But instead, there was this stinky fisherman who said, the kingdom of God has come near to your home today. And they despised him because he was not, he was not from, the, from the right schools. He was not mainstream. He was not dressed properly. His words were rough. And yet, if you had an ounce of the Spirit of God, you would recognize it in Peter, in James, in John, in Matthew, and Mark, all the disciples, in Paul. But these people weren't celebrities then. That's the that's the rub. They weren't your they weren't your Billy Grahams. They weren't your Joel Osteens. And so they were despised and rejected of humanity. And yet they will have their day upon the earth as rulers and reigners and those who rejected them will be standing at the great white throne having the film of their life run and the lord will say to them you rejected the truth and they will say when lord when did we reject the truth we never rejected the truth we lived in israel we loved the truth while we entertained all the high priests at our house and the film will be run and there will be a knock on the door and poor agnes will look at joe and say oh no i remember that day that weird guy came to my house and God will say, uh, that wasn't a weird guy. That was my choice for the next ruler of the earth. But you judged things by the outside of the cup. You looked at the whitewash. You were impressed by the degrees, by the whitewash, by the decorations, the sculpture, the beautiful art upon the tomb. But you never sniffed inside of it. You never took a flashlight. You never went to the freaking trouble to get a flashlight and shine it inside the tomb. And if you had done that, you would have seen that it was full of the bones of the dead. But you didn't do it because you didn't care. Because you wanted to be accepted. You wanted to be loved. And you wanted to have a Friday every day. That's why you didn't care. 
I'm going to get to the children. But boy, did Jesus rake these people over the coals. And these people are alive and well today. Only the names have changed. I mentioned this first yesterday, Matthew 23, 13. I just didn't go here. Now, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are locking the kingdom of the heavens in front of men, in front of humans, literally. For you are not entering, neither are you letting those entering to entering. Those entering, those who would enter, those who are on their way to entering, they're prevented from that. And isn't this the bizarre thing? The first thing people want to do when you begin to enter, when you begin to think for the first time about God, we have to get that guy in church quick. We have to institutionalize him. We have to get him into a system where he can be under the authority of a man of God, where he can be uh, discipled. This discipleship BS that they're telling you you need. Uh, he needs to be he needs to be accountable now to a body of people. Yeah. Well, what happened to the body of Christ? But see, this is what happens. As soon as one begins to enter, uh, there come these professional clergymen, professional clergymen. I want to spit that phrase out of my mouth because it stinks so bad, smells so bad. Professional clergymen? Woe to you, professional clergymen, for you're locking the kingdom of the heavens in front of humans. For you're not entering. That's obvious. I mean, come on. You're a professional clergyman. You're a mainstream. You, you, you uh, are a purveyor of main, mainstream mayhem. You are a an idiot in the things of God, but you're a genius in the ways of manipulating people using God. You're disgusting. You're not entering, that's obvious, but neither are you letting those entering to enter. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, professional clergymen, professional religionists, for you are going about the sea and the dry land to make one proselyte. And whenever he may be becoming one, whenever you get somebody to join your church, whenever you get somebody to sign that piece of paper so that you can boast in membership, because when you went to the seminary, you took a class on church membership. I know you did. And you learned techniques for getting people, for manipulating people into your building, into your system, so that you could build a kingdom apart from the kingdom of Christ. It's not Christ's kingdom, it's yours. You whitewash it in the name of Christ. Oh, you're good at that. So you go about the sea and the dry land to make one proselyte, and whenever he may be becoming one, you are making him more than double a son of Gehenna than you are. Great job. Nice job, shepherd. Nice job, sheep, person. You ruin the lives of hundreds of people. I used to think back in the day if I could just write to the pastors, to the priests, to those in charge of hundreds of people, and if I could convince them of the truth, if I could get them to see the light of the gospel of grace and its outcome, which is the salvation of all, if I could get them to see the light, then behind them were hundreds of people in their charge, and by reaching one, I could then reach 101. But forget about it. It never worked that way because you might as well be writing a letter to a brick wall. Verse 23, now, these it was binding for you and not to leave those. Uh, that's out of context. Forget that. Uh, blind guides, Jesus calls the Pharisees in verse 23 and the professional clergyman, straining out a gnat yet swallowing a camel. That is so horribly perfect of a description. Straining out a gnat yet swallowing a camel. So there you are, professional clergyman, going to the seminaries, otherwise known as the cemeteries, to learn how to get church membership. And you're straining out a gnat. You're getting your whatever degrees, uh, the master of divinity. How pompous. How, what, what a pile of dung, master of divinity. I'm not impressed. In fact, I'm depressed. Because you're straining out a gnat. You're learning about world religions. Who gives a crap about any of that? Because you're swallowing the camel. You're swallowing the doctrines of eternal torment, the doctrines of free will, and the doctrines of the Trinity. These are giant, hairy, bestial doctrines of demons, the camels of this context. You're swallowing them whole. Oh, the eternal torment sounds good to me. Free will. Salvation is decided by a human's willpower. Salvation by willpower. There's another direct statement. There's another exposure of what the free will really is. The opposite of a euphemism. Thank you very much. It's the 
salvation by human willpower. That's a camel. You swallow it. In the meantime, congratulations. You've upped your church membership by 50 people from last month. That'll get you a promotion, I think. I think that'll increase your wage. Your wife will be happy with you. She'll give you a big kiss. You'll be able to take your kids to Disneyland. And great. And, and then your whole family, your whole damn family then will be at the great white throne. Way to go. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. You made them double the sons of Gehenna that you are. Gehenna Meister. Mm. So it's not over. There's still a chance to hear the truth. Now I want to go back to Matthew chapter 11, and that's just what I'm going to do here. I love the idea of, of these kids. Listen to verse 16. You see, you professional clergymen, you need to become as kids. You need to quit using God to make a living, and you need to become as children. Just start looking under the beds, looking in the closets, looking uh, under the furniture of God. Of God, you need to be bold. You need to go for broke. You need to quit thinking about what your uh, your what do you call the head of your organization, the chief pastor, the pastor, whatever. I don't care. You need to not worry about what they're going to think or what your congregation is going to think of you or what your wife is going to think of you. Be a man. You know, search the truth. Bring your family into the truth, no matter what it costs you, because it will cost you and it will cost you dearly to embrace the truth. It has cost all of us. We've been thought to be crazy. We've been ignored. We've been marginalized. We've been disparaged, blamed, ridiculed, mocked. People tell me, who do you think you are? You think you're better than these Greek scholars who say that the word I own means eternity? Or you think you're better than these guys where, 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 where's your degree i hear that all the time what school did you go to and i tell them i went to the same school peter and john went to in acts what, what school is that i said exactly they didn't go to any school they had been with jesus that was their that's what it said on their business card <laughs> i was with jesus that's it? You want more than that? How dare you? How dare you want more than that? How dare you think that any more than that is necessary? You're with Jesus. And it was not an easy thing to walk with Jesus back in the day. And it's not an easy thing to walk with the real Jesus today. Because it's just like the first century. History repeats itself. Only the names have changed. Because today, Jesus is still wandering the hills and the countryside. He's still sitting at a campfire with 12 people on the Mount of Olives by the Sea of Galilee. Still the same. But Martin, Jesus went to the temple. Yeah, that's where he went when it was time to die. He went to the temple. And he exposed the lies and the hypocrisies of the ruling class, the religious class, the people with the degrees, the professional clergymen who were good at building their kingdom to the point that a man who had been blind and who was healed, they put him out of the sanctuary and ruined his life in the system. But I believe this man learned to survive well outside of the system. And he probably, be, probably on that day became a disciple of Christ. His family may have thought he was crazy. You ruined everything for us. Maybe his whole family might have gotten thrown out of the temple. That was a big deal then. He had many advantages for being a member of the organization, the ruling religious class of that day. To come under their teaching, you had many physical advantages. So it was, it was a big deal to be excommunicated. Same with the Catholic Church. When you got excommunicated from the Catholic Church back in the day, it was rough. It's still rough today, maybe not physically, but emotionally. People can't believe you could leave the mother church. How could you leave the mother church? And you become crazy. Or you become labeled that. In fact, you're not crazy. In fact, you're becoming the most sane, the most lucid, the brightest you've ever been. When you leave this institution to embrace the truth of Christ, you become more real than you've ever been. Brighter, bigger, better. In the eyes of God and in the eyes of the celestials, in the eyes of humans, forget it. You've just been demoted to the abyss. The abyss. 
but I would rather be demoted to the abyss in this life and to shine in the next life in the judgment, which we don't even come into judgment. Would rather shine than to be judged. Then, you see, it's all about the last becoming first and the first becoming last. That's not just a happy little Bible saying, my friends. It's the truth.